Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Tonight we're going to get into some fascinating stories. There, there is a, there's a story that we're going to touch on tonight. Actually, the, it's the first story we're going to read. It is a very, very important story to know. Lots of good lessons to be learned from this story. So I'm looking forward to this. So once again, everyone, welcome, welcome on whatever platform you're on. I know we're live streaming on many different platforms right now. So um, tonight we're going to get into 2 Kings chapter 5 through 11. We're going to read seven chapters. We're going to be talking about the prophet Elisha or Elisha. We're going to be talking about Naaman, okay, um, more accurately pronounced as Naaman. Naaman. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the miracles that Elisha uh, done. So it's going to be very, very interesting. Those in the chat, see what we have here. Calamento says, uh, Shalom, everyone. One John says, Shalom. To Yah be the glory, says Shalom, siblings in truth seeking. Amen. Uh, question for move says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Psalm 94 says, Shalom, everyone. Blessings, blessings to you. Tammy says, Shalom, all. And so, yeah, let me see. Before we get into these other comments here, just want to welcome all you guys. Shalom. Welcome. Great to see you guys as always. Blessings multiplied to you guys. I pray that. Uh, you know, that God speaks through his word tonight, right? Speaks through his word. Or if you're on the other side of the world, as some, we have Vinny joining us usually, and uh, it would be not tonight, but today or this morning. So, yes, uh, awesome. When I first learned about this story and learned about the depth of it, especially the story of Naaman uh, and how he received his miracle from God. This is something that's very, very important. It is, it is a concept that is uh, still in effect today, and it can help every one of us out if we really, really uh, learn from this and put it into practice. So, let's see what we have here. Question for move says, I just have a really quick question and then we'll probably go afterwards. Sorry for asking a question so early then leaving. Um, I just had a really quick question. I have an assignment and I have, have to choose three people. I choose one to be fictional, but some red flags. Number one, I saw an Instagram post that call him the savior. And number two, the show is about slaying demons, not real, really spiritually spiritual demons, but more of a monster eating humans. Um, and since it is God slash Holy Spirit and Jesus' power to cast out demons, would it be blasphemy to use this character? Uh, I... Um, So let me just let me just think about this for a moment here before I want to make sure I'm super accurate here. So you 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 choose one to be fictional. You have to choose three people, one to be fictional, but from uh, some red flags. I saw an Instagram post that call that call him the savior. Okay, so that in and of itself, I it, it depends on the context of it. I mean, if it if it's if this particular character is called like the savior of all kind, but it's, I, you just have to be very careful. Um, if it's somebody, if it's something or some character that people worship or idolize, I mean, to that extent, then I would be careful about that. Um, but just simply somebody being called the savior, I really, in and of itself, it doesn't really 
it, it's not a big deal. I mean, you can be you can be the savior for anything, right? I mean, not necessarily meaning like the savior of all mankind. Um, uh, so it all depends on the context. Number two, the show is about slaying demons, not really spiritual demons, but more of a monster eating humans. And since it is God slash Holy Spirit and Jesus power to cast out demons, would it be blasphemy to use this character? So blasphemy would be like to speak evil of God or to um, like project evil on God or the spirit of God. Uh, so if, if this character has what is um, purported to be the Holy Spirit, and that spirit is actually an evil spirit, then that would be blasphemy. Uh, again, I don't know all of the details. Um, if it's just a fictional character that's called the Savior, and it's a fictional uh, show about slaying, quote-unquote, demons, like monster-eating humans, um, more of a monster eating humans, mon monster eating humans. Um, I mean, if it's not directly blaspheming or it's not really putting a bad name on God or the Spirit of God or Yeshua, I, I you have to be careful. It's hard to answer that question. Um, I wouldn't say, I, the with with the details you gave me question for move I don't see that it's like clear blasphemy but I, that doesn't mean it's not <laughs> because I don't know all the details uh, I mean you got someone like uh Superman right and and you could call Superman well he is the savior and um this kind of thing This character uses a really cool sword and uses certain breathing techniques to enhance his speed, body, and stuff. Um, I only saw the Savior term in a single Instagram post. Does it still count? Now that would just bring up more questions, like breathing techniques. Is this something like a you know like a yoga or some something like that, or some other um, mystical? religion that's tied to it if that's the case i certainly wouldn't be using that um yeah so yeah so to yabi the glory says i would i would pray on it i would pray on it if it were me uh sounds like it, it it includes mysticism or magic maybe choose a different character yeah like if, if it chooses magic i would i would not i would I would not get involved with that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, pray about it. So, yeah, just be careful. Anything, of course, anything that goes against God's law, you know, uh, again, using breathing techniques, that kind of makes me ask questions about how that is and what's... You know, what is it that is portrayed? Uh, is that, you know, is that some kind of, uh, uh, you know, is that something from a, a non-godly source, an ungodly source? Uh, so, yeah, it's something, I, I mean, if you don't have to use a character like that, I mean... It's hard for me to give you advice on on very limited information. I hope that helps question for move. Okay, so um, thanks for asking question for move. Again, I can't give you a whole lot of information on limited without actually knowing uh, this, the character or, you know, researching the character, all that kind of thing. Yeah, just just be careful. It sounds like I'd be looking into, I mean, I'd, I'd be looking into other options.
Okay, so let's start with this. This is 2 Kings chapter 5. If those of you, you know, and I know I say this often, but I'll say it again. If if someone comes to your mind, um, if someone comes to your mind that you think would benefit from some of the things that we talk about, uh, send them a message and, um, and invite them. Send them a message and invite them because we're going to be talking about things that are, well, as far as I see, unless we have some, unless, you know, later on we'll get into other questions or whatever, as far as I see, it's not going to be the typical, it's going to be something that almost any Christian should be able to receive and, and benefit from. Without without any ado, if you want to put it that way, um, just to further like as I get more information here, Psalm Psalm ninety four says, "Is this like an anime character?" Question for move says yes. Yeah, so I mean, the more I learn about it, the more it doesn't sound good. Question for move, it's anime. What good? What good is there in anime, really? I know someone might argue whether well, there is something good there, but I, I, I personally don't know. Uh, anime seems to be something that's not very good at all. Vinny says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Vinny. The Great Deception says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, The Great Deception. Good to see you guys. Hope you're having an awesome day or evening. Blessings, guys. Blessings. Okay, so let's let's get into this. This is something that we should never forget. This this is this is a story that we can really glean a lot of good wisdom from, and something that I have never forgotten um, for uh, how many years since I've been studying this story. So um, let's get into it. This is Second Kings chapter five. Now. Naaman, or Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was then was a great man in the view of his master and eminent, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now, and let me just stop here, because I think it's important to kind of uh, absorb the, the, the full worth of this story. So Naaman was a great man, commander of, like he had a, a good position, a high position, uh, commander of the army of the king of Aram, great man in the view of his master, eminent, okay, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. So this was not just any old man. This was a, this was a man who had social status, this was a man who was a great man, as it says here, in the view of his master, in the view, in the view of the king, because by him, the Lord. So he was a man that was used of the Lord. Okay, so let's let's really grasp or try to grasp exactly who this man was. Again, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this story because it's, there is a wonderful, wonderful message here and a wonderful lesson to be learned. So this man, let me just let me just interject this in this in, right here. This man would be prone to be to be proud. okay? He was a man that would that would be prone to be proud. He's a sure candidate for, a man of pride because of his position, commander of the army of the king of Aram, uh, because he was already viewed as a great man and he was eminent and the Lord even used him to give victory to Aram. Okay. The man was also a valiant warrior, but afflicted with leprosy. A valiant warrior upon all of it, but afflicted with leprosy. So why would this happen, you might say? Great man, high social status, prestigious, eminent, used of the Lord, but smitten with leprosy. Why? 
Verse 2, now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. So in the footnotes we have here was before, literally was before, which uh, the translators believe that it means to be uh, waited on Naaman's wife or almost like a maid. Um, and she said to her mistress, Naaman's wife, if only my master were with the prophet, and in the footnotes, literally before the prophet, who is in Samaria, then he would cure him of his leprosy. Wow. That's it. Right? Powerful statement. Powerful statement. A statement of, I mean, she's a, she gave a statement of truth here. And a statement of longing, if only Naaman were before the prophet. In other words, in the presence of the prophet who is in Samaria, then he would cure him of his leprosy. Verse 4, and Naaman went in and told his master. Now in the footnotes, Naaman and he, literally he, went in and told his master, saying, The girl who is from the land of Israel spoke such and such. Then the king of Aram said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Okay, so look, I mean, okay, again, let's let's take this kind of slow here. We want to get the, we need to, let's get as much nutrition from this as possible, spiritual nutrition. So Naaman, Naaman, instantly got leave from the king of 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 Aram saying, go now and, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So from one king to the, to the other king about a great man, a, a man of high position within the kingdom. Okay, so Naaman had everything going for him here, except for his leprosy, of course. He had the king of Aram. He had, you know, uh, Endorsement basically from him and the letter from the king of Aram to the king of Israel. Okay, so can you imagine being in this, being part of the upper crust, being part of the upper crust of, of the society, a valiant warrior, someone whom was used by God, great man. Commander of the army of the king of Aram. Had a great reputation. Probably very well known. Famous. Well respected, obviously. And backed by, by the king. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver. Okay, so it's, you know, good thing to do. Take some... Uh, a, a, what would you say, a gift? 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. So 10 talents of silver, a talent was about 75 pounds, so that'd be 750 pounds of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold. A shekel was about a half an ounce, right? So that would be like three thousand ounces of gold and ch and 10 changes of clothes right i guess for the for the trip and he brought the letter to the king of israel which said quote and now as this letter comes to you behold i have sent naaman my servant to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy unquote but when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to keep alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. In other words, he's setting me up. He's setting me up. Literally, an opportunity against me. 
And he's picking a fight with me. Verse 8. Now it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. And he sent word to the king saying, why did you tear your clothes? Just have him come to me. And he shall learn that there is a prophet in Israel. Very, very confident. Extremely confident. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of Elisha's house. Okay. Can you imagine? Let's just stop here for a second. Just imagine this. Naaman, Naaman was at the door, knocking on Elisha's door, Elisha's door. Can you imagine being Elisha inside the house? I can picture, you know, probably an elderly man, you know, maybe, I don't know, in a rocking chair or something. Uh, who's at the door? Naaman. You know, the valiant warrior, the king's more or less right-hand right hand man. And he's got his entire entourage here. He's got his horses and his chariots. You see him all around. Look out the window. Look at it. Look at this. Look what's going on here. We've got the great man at the door for, for a miracle of God to be cured of his leprosy. What did Elisha do? What did Elisha do? It says, no, let, me, let me just ask you, let me just ask you a question. Did, did Elisha say, oh, wow, I think I better, you know, kind of get ready here a little bit and make sure I, you know, answer the door and greet him and come in to the, you know, and 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 you know, get make sure everything's all spick and span, make sure you make sure he's served well, make sure he's got the best food, make sure he's got the best. Beverages, everything that's needed there. Make sure he's treated like a king because the king sent him and he's like so prestigious and eminent. A very highly esteemed man of high social, you know, high social esteem. What did Elisha do? Is that what he did? Let's read it. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. Okay, watch this, watch this. Elisha didn't even get up to go and greet him. Think about that for a second. Elisha did not even prepare, didn't even, didn't even bother going to the door. Think about that. Ah, it's Naaman. <laughs> okay, Dad. Hey, uh, servant boy. Hey, come here, little boy. You go tell that man, uh, go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Um, okay. What do you think Naaman did? I know this, a lot of you know the story, but... How do you think, how would you respond if you were in Naaman's position? Having such a great reputation and being so well known and, and having so much achievement under your belt and wow. And you go to, a, to another country with the letter endorsed of the king. And you come to the prophet's door and you knock. And the prophet sends a little messenger, doesn't even come to the door. Doesn't even bother coming and saying, Hail Naaman. <laughs> doesn't bother doing that at all. Don't even see him. Doesn't even bother getting up off of his rocking chair. This is a powerful story. Again, please, I encourage you guys. Think about this. Think about this. This is powerful. Elijah sent a messenger to him. That's all he did. 
didn't even bother going to the door. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. What did that mean? What did that look like? How would that play out in in Naaman's mind? It's like, first of all, I, the Jordan is a dirty river. Um, not not only that, but it, it doesn't is you know explicitly painted out for us here. But Naaman would have to disrobe. He would have to disrobe in front of everybody. And he would have to show everybody how badly diseased he is. Think about this. Think about this. This is a powerful lesson to be learned here. He, it, would, it would mean that he would have to humble himself to the lowest. He would have to disrobe, perhaps even comp- you know, take everything off in front of everybody and show everybody how diseased he is and bathe in front of everybody in dirty water. This great man. This man who is high up on the social scale. Very high. Verse 11, But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought... He will certainly come out to me, which he didn't, of course, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the site and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, not better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. That's just, again, that's... Let's get some spiritual nutrition from this. He was furious. Why? Because obviously this this really hurt his pride. He would certainly was not willing to do that, to humble himself to that degree. I thought, I thought, he said, behold, I thought he will certainly come out to me. See, so this is one of the characteristics of pride expectations not met. When when we have expectations fueled by pride and they're not met, you always have someone who is furious. Okay? Pride produces expectations and when those expectations are not met, we have anger. Right? I, I, you know, on the flip side, you know, um, Contrasted to this would be if if Naaman was humble, he wouldn't be furious because he wouldn't have any expectation that was unmet. He wouldn't he wouldn't hold Elisha to any expectations. He would expect the least because as a humble man, he would think of himself as the least. But no. His pride got in the way and fueled his fury. So he had he he, he came to Elisha's door already with something on his mind with an expectation of exactly how it should be played out. He will come out to me. He will basically he will greet me, kind of thing. He will pay homage to me. He might you know bow down to me. He might whatever he thought. I'm not sure. It doesn't it's not very explicit here. Probably how everybody else greeted him, probably with with great respect, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. So in other words, again, he he had in his mind that it, it was supposed to happen in a certain way. He had expectations. Wave his hand over the site and cure the leprosy. And then he goes on saying, oh, you know, basically... Uh, um, the Jordan is a dirty river. Why? Why? Why should I go to that of all things? If you want me to humble myself and disrobe, and you know, at least give me a good, you know, a beautiful river to do it in, not the Jordan. So he turned went away in a rage. Again, why? Because of his pride. Verse thirteen. Then his servants approached and spoke to him, saying. 
my father? Had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? In other words, if the prophet told you to climb Mount Everest for this miracle, would you not have done it? Yeah, of course you would have done it because it feeds your pride. How much more then, he's, when he says to you, wash and be clean. Just simple. It's not a great thing, but it's a very simple and easy thing. Like, Naman, why are you so furious? This is easy. Well, of course, it wasn't easy for Naman because, he, because of his pride. Verse 14. So, so, this, so basically what happened here is his servants, the servants of Naaman, the servants of Naaman, broke his pride when they said this to him. They broke his pride. So in verse 14, he humbled himself. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Can you imagine how humiliating that would be? A great man, prestigious man, and someone who is elite has to take off his clothes, show the world how diseased he really is, and wash in dirty water in front of everybody. Very humiliating. But he had to humble himself to do that. He had to swallow his pride and obey the prophet. See, the prophet, Elisha, it was all by design he didn't go out. It was all by design that it says here um, that the prophet just sent a messenger. Where is it here? Um Sorry for the scrolling here. And Elisha sent sent a messenger to him. See, Elisha, I believe, already had, he already knew what was going on. And he already knew what, what Naaman needed. He needed to break his pride. Therefore, Elisha is not even going to go out and pay attention to him. Elisha is not even going to pay attention to him much at all. He knew that Naaman needed to break his pride. So he just sent a little messenger to him and told him to do something that is very simple and not very extravagant. So Naaman did that, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times in accordance with the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Very powerful. Now, just a little bit of comments here on this before we go into the next, se next section. You see this throughout the scriptures. If you need a miracle from God, if you want God to do something for you in your life, even if it's just showing up, even if it's whatever it is, you need humility. Remember, it says God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You don't want to be resist. You don't want God to resist you. You want God to give you grace. Notice it doesn't say God gives grace to everybody. God gives grace to the humble. There's a condition there. And he resists the proud. You, If you study the miracles that we that we have all throughout the scriptures all throughout the scriptures you will see this kind of this kind of element of the humility involved in many of them someone might say well look at when yeshua look at when jesus was on this earth and he was just healing everybody left right and center but it really didn't happen that way he preached hard, very hard 
teachings before he did miracles many times maybe not every, not maybe not every time but many times he did you look when it says that you know they, they were all healed like how it says in the, in the gospels you know we see in, in in various places you know and he healed them all and he healed them all and he healed them all but you need to ask the question what's the context of that yeshua was like an open air preacher and I've done this myself, open air. An open air preacher, you've really got to try to get everybody's attention and keep their attention because it's so easy for them just to walk away. If you say something they don't like, it's just so easy for them to walk away. They don't like it, walk away, walk right by. So the people who were there after Yeshua taught his hard teachings and some of his teachings were hard i mean in a way they weren't hard but in a way they were like, if you know what i mean they're easy if you want to you know deny yourself and hum humble yourself it's easy but i mean again if you have pride that you need to sacrifice well it might not be that easy but when yeshua got finished teaching the only people that were left there the all were those who were humble enough and strong enough to, st to stick around. Humble enough, desperate enough, and strong enough, emotionally, spiritually, to withstand that hard teaching. So when it says he healed everyone, it was in context everyone who was there, not everyone in a universal absolute sense. Because a lot, I believe, just just ignored Jesus, just ignored, walked away from Yeshua. Because they didn't like what he was saying. So humility is vital. It is a vital element of your spiritual walk with God, right? It says in, uh, just come to my mind right now, what does he require of you? Micah. Uh, give me a second here. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He, speaking of God, has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, this word justly is synonymous with righteousness, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly with your God. So it's by the grace of God that God moves in our lives, right? It's by the grace of God that he blesses us. And so... If we want the grace of God, we need to position ourselves to receive the grace of God. And the best position is the position of humility. This is why I believe it's so important to be able to listen to people you don't agree with. I'm not saying agree with them. At least listen to them. You can learn from them. You can learn that may be that may mean agreeing with them on on certain points or even all points if they actually present evidence that is um, to prove like what they're saying is true, right? If if they provide enough evidence, then yes. If they provide plausible, uh, good evidence, then yes. We should need we should be willing to humble ourselves and to listen. But listening is just one part of humility. There's a there's a lot more to humility than that. Naaman listened. Naaman listened to his servants, which broke the pride off his back, and he got healed. Can you imagine what would have happened if he if he would have just persisted stubbornly in his pride? What would have happened? Definitely would not have gotten healed at all. 
God, who knows? I mean, it would have been a very, very miserable life for him. Perhaps even a shorter life for him. More than likely, a shorter life for him. But he chose to listen. He chose to humble himself. So never forget the story of Naaman at the River Jordan. How he chose to humble himself. Wow. It's a beautiful story. It's a powerful story. Quickly, before we get into the next section, I just, I'll just go some, through some of your live chat quickly here. Mark says, Shalom. Shalom, Mark. Good to see you. Blessings. Interesting concept, kingdom concepts. This is an interesting thing. And this, you know, and I like this kind of thing because, you know, as you know, I, I believe in a supernatural God. I believe that God does miracles. But I also believe, as many of you know, that God is a very practical God, right? He's very practical. So I like this. The Yarden is muddy. Um, for those who are just joining, or if you're not familiar with this, the Yarden is that, actually Yarden is a more accurate way of pronouncing Jordan. Um, so yeah, the Yarden is muddy, contains minerals that can heal skin. Very interesting. So yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. To Yah be the glory, said, it says, wow, what a beautiful picture of how to help the proud see their pride. Elisha knew well, being led of the Spirit. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and this is a good, a good point too. Maybe a heavy dose of experience with, with proud people also. Yeah, yeah. And learn a lot of, learn a lot of things. Humility is... Such a major part of our walk towards the Father. Word study of the term in Scripture was a very helpful in my walk. Humility, yeah. Humility is is tied. The The word in Hebrew for humility is, uh, is related to uh, another word that means afflicted, right? So... It's it's very interesting because one it, when you get people that are not afflicted if they're pampered all their life right if they're pampered all their life and they never get afflicted even figuratively speaking f afflicted even virtually <laughs> uh, you know afflicted somehow um, it it it's really bad for them it's really really bad for them uh, it's the afflictions that that help us to you know uh, well, that's what causes us to be humble. Uh, and actually, in order to be humble, we have to afflict ourselves, right? In one way or, or another, we have to somehow afflict ourselves to be humble. Uh, but sometimes people need outside, um, what do you call it, peripheral, outside of the self. They need to they need to have uh, affliction come from uh, an outside source. They need they need humility outsourced, right? They need affliction outsourced. And that's one of the biggest problems in the in the in the developed world today. Actually, is be, I mean, you know, on one hand, to be you know very blessed is really good, obviously. But on the other hand, it's almost like it's it can be it can easily be very deceptive because that lack of affliction can lead to pride, which can lead to lots of problems, lots of problems. So. Very, very important lesson to learn. Let's continue reading. This is 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 15, Nehazi's greed. Then he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold now, I know there is no God 
in all the earth except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant now. So again, this is talking about Naaman, Naaman, who is um, wanting to give the gifts that he brought. Remember, he brought lots of uh, riches, riches. Um, but he, being um, Elisha, says, As surely as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will accept nothing. And he urged him to accept it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let your servant be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer a burnt offering nor, sac nor a sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Regarding this matter, may the Lord forgive your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon up there and he leans on my hand and I bow down in the house of Ramon. When I bow down in the house of Ramon, may the Lord please forgive your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. So he went some distance from him. Now, isn't this interesting as well? You got you to gotta look at this. Apparently, Elisha did not have a problem with Naaman doing this. I mean, Naaman was open. He was honest um, before the Lord, before the prophet of his concern that um, the, the Lord might not be happy with him going into basically a house of idols and, and assisting his master, the, the king, to worship idols, more or less assist him in walking, it looks like, and he leans on my hand and I bow down in the house of Ramon. When I bow down in the house of Ramon, may the Lord please Give or forgive your servant in this matter. He said to him, go in peace. Isn't this interesting? And he went some distance from him. I'm interested. I'm just interested here. Let's see what it says in Safaria about, about that particular verse from, a, from the Jewish point of view. Um, uh, verse was that, that was verse 19 or 18. House of Ramon, name of a pagan deity. To bow down there against my will when my master bows because he leans on my hand. Doesn't really say a whole lot there. Uh, we got lots of other different um, commentaries. I'm not going to get into all that. You know, it's 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 kind of amazing to me that Rashi doesn't say a whole lot about this at all. Now I know there are others here, and I don't see Ramban here at all. So it's it's amazing. Uh, it's it's amazing how Elisha would respond like this. You know? Because you got some people today, you know, in especially in the Hebrew roots movement, uh, and they're so against, I mean, they're so against anything, and, and I, I respect, I respect it, but you see, like, what would a Hebrew roots person say if they were there? Hey, it's a pagan deity. It's pagan. It's a pagan deity. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, pagan deity, and he leans on my hand and bow, and I bow down in the house of the pagan deity. Now, most people would probably say, "Oh, you know, that, you know, repent. Don't. I mean, don't do it. Don't go there at all. I mean." Uh, you know, Elisha should say, no, no, don't go back to your uh, to that anymore. Stay here with me and I'll teach you the ways of the Lord or something like that. No. He said, go in peace. In other words, it's okay. In other words, it's okay. Not okay. And let me just 
clarify. It's not okay to worship a pagan. Of course not. Not okay. Not okay to to worship Ramon. Uh, I don't think that this is uh, that Naaman was saying that he's actually worshiping Ramon. He's just basically assisting his master um, in the rituals of that pagan deity. But apparently, it's it's not entirely rejected by Elisha. It reminds me of how God treats some people sometimes, like when they want to be given over to a depraved mind, God gives them over to be to a depraved mind. Rep reprobate mind. Interesting, the response here. Very interesting. Verse 20, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Hmm, behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the our man, our man, by not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. Hmm. Excuse me. It's like, it's like, oh, uh, look at all the gold. Look at all the gold. Look at all the silver. Look at all the riches. Look at all the money. Look at it. It's just coming out. It's just everywhere. Fort Knox. I mean, it's, it's it's just a traveling Fort Knox here. I think I'll avail myself a little bit of this stuff. All right, you know. Uh, why why did uh, why did Elisha reject this? Hey, we can use the money for something good. Verse twenty one. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw someone running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, "Is everything well?" And he said, "Everything is well." My master has sent me. Oh, so we're lying now, are we? Saying, behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Aphraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, be sure to take two talents. And he urged them and tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them before him. That's, I mean, 75 pounds each. It's a lot. Uh, when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and deposited them in the house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. But when, but he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. <laughs> you don't lie to a prophet, okay? That's, that's not a very uh, Gehazi, man. You, you should know better than that, especially serving in the presence of Elisha for so long. You should know that. Then he said to him, did my heart, this would probably also mean spirit, did my heart or spirit not go with you when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Ah, uh -huh. you're caught red... Caught red, red-handed there, Gehazi. Is it a time to accept money or and to accept clothes, olive groves, vineyards, sheep, oxen, and male and female slaves? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, afflicted with leprosy, as white as snow. Wow. That's amazing. Notice the descendants have has got the curse too, right? So, and this also brings up, you know what I'm going to talk about, the seed, the descendants. Again, this reminds me of Paul saying, it only says seed, doesn't say seeds, therefore it's only one and not many. Um, sorry, Paul, but <laughs> that's not how it works, okay? And when, you, when it says Zerah Zera in the Hebrew, it means descendants, there's no such thing as zeraim, or the, the plural of seed in the Hebrew, meaning as descendants. So, of course, you got questions. Okay, so uh, I thought it, I thought it says that the children will not be will not bear the guilt or the will not die. That is for the sins of their father. And so, again. In Deuteronomy 24, where it says that, and Ezekiel chapter 18, where it says that very clearly, it's talking about salvation. 
um, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Deuteronomy 28, talking about um, life, choose life, not death, right? Um, live. If you do these commandments, you will live. That's talking about salvation. If you, do, if you don't do these commandments, you will die. That's, that's not talking about biological death. That's talking about spiritual death. So Deuteronomy 24 and Ezekiel 18 is talking about being bearing the sins, being punished um, or taking, paying in place of another person. Like you say, father and a son. A father who loves his son so much, he says, oh, I don't want my, my son is the one who's sinning. I don't want my son to suffer the wrath of God for that. I, I'll do that instead. That's what that means. That won't work. Okay. Um, in, you know, in the opposite, right? The son might love the father so much, say, I know my father's an ungodly man. So Lord, I will take the bur I will take his burden. I will take his sin and I'll die. So to speak, I'll die. I'll, I'll receive the wrath of God instead of him. That doesn't work. That's not justice. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about basically a generational curse, right? A generational curse. So the descendants of Naaman, uh, excuse me, the descendants of Gehazi bore the consequence of Gehazi's sin. Not that they paid for his sin so that Gehazi can go free, but they were basically in the line of fire. They were, they bore the consequence of a sin, just like how, again, we got seemingly or like children or elderly people in uh, the Noah's flood or Sodom and Gomorrah, this kind of thing. Um, same kind of thing, same kind of, um, same kind of circumstance. One person cannot pay for another person's sin. In other words, the father cannot take, cannot die for, for the son or the son for the father as a substitute, but rather um, one can be, I mean, one can bear the consequence of the other sin. That's, that's obvious. I mean, you can, uh, a father can, and we see that all the time, actually, right? I mean, children bear the consequences of their, of their, of the sins of their parents a lot. If their parents are very ungodly people and doing things they shouldn't be doing, those poor children are going to, are going to be um, bearing consequences. Um, just the way it works, right? So that is what this is talking about. So it's not like the descendants of Gehazi bore the wrath of God for him, but rather they were uh, afflicted in cons consequently for, uh, because of him. Second Kings chapter 6. The axe had recovered. Now, this is something, just before I get in to read this, this is something that could be, I, I wouldn't doubt this is something that, that could be explained in a practical way as well. I, I, I'm not aware of any practical explanation for this. Maybe one of you guys are in the live chat. If you are, uh, tag me there and at Christopher and, and let me know. But um uh, I mean, it could be a miracle. I mean, God can do whatever he wants to do and he does whatever he wants to do. That's for sure. But uh, it, it could be some practical thing, uh, element to it as well. Verse one. Now the sons of the prophets of, or the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, behold now, the place before you where, where we are living is too cramped for us. Please let us go to the Jordan or the yard uh, and let us take each take from there a beam and let us construct a place there for ourselves to live there. So he said, go. Then one of them said, please agree and go with your servants. And he said, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But it happened that as one of them was cutting down a beam, the axe head fell into the water 
And he cried out and said, Oh, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in, in there and made the iron float. Then he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. So, an amazing story here of an iron axe head that fell into the water that was recovered by some, by Elisha cutting off a stick and throwing it in there, made the iron float. How that happened, I could not tell you. Uh, but um, it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. The Aramaeans plot to capture Elisha. Now the king of Aram making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Be careful that you do not pass this place, because the Aramaeans are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent scouts to the place about which the man of God had told him, so he warned him, so that he was on his guard there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this matter, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, No, my lord, the king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the the king of Israel, the words that you speak in your bedroom. This reminds me. This reminds me. Let me just tell you. This This is a, several years ago. I, I, let me just pause here for a second. This reminds me of something. Several years ago, I had, um, I went to the restaurant with a, a pastor um, of a church not too far from, from where I live. And, and uh, we were talking about prophets. And this particular pastor said that back in the olden days, like this would have been back, uh, uh, like assuming, you know, maybe like 100, 200 years ago, that kind of thing, is like back in the olden days when, when a so-called, when a prophet came to town, or an evangelist that was known to, you know, have a really good ear to the track, so to speak, hear, uh, hear the word of the Lord, uh, nobody would dare go to the meetings unless they repented first, because they knew if they went to those meetings, their sin would be called out. Their secret sins would be called out. Reminds me of, you know, here I am, I'm quoting Paul here. Reminds me of, um, uh, let me see, First Corinthians, uh, let's pull it up here. First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14. And this is good. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 24. Check this out. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin 
and are brought under judgment by all. I like that because you see a lot of people today say, oh, but Jesus said, judge not. <laughs> of course, in context, he wasn't talking, he, was, he wasn't talking to his followers. He was talking to, to the hypocrites, but, um, but listen to this. I, this is, this is good. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in, in other words, comes into the meeting that you guys are at, while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. B by the way, when I read this and I'll read the next verse, ask, you know, at, we got to ask a question. How much, like, this is the way church should be. This is how church should be. How often do you see these things happening in church? If an unbeliever or an inquirer, there's someone who's seeking or maybe an, agno an agnostic or something comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin. Like, it's, it's not like, oh, maybe perhaps they'll get convicted of sin. No, it's like they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now, that is what should be happening in every church, in every service. That's what should be happening. By the way, that pastor who told me, because it's true. He, that's what he, was, he said. Like he said, back in the old days, this is what would happen. Like if you have a, a guest evangelist come that, you know, that can prophesy, you wouldn't dare go to that meeting unless you repented of all your sins before you walked in that door. Or else the secrets of your hearts would be laid bare and you'd be convicted of sin and, and judged of all. But the question is, why doesn't that happen today? Why doesn't that happen today? I've seen it happen. Personally, I've seen something like this happen. Um, sins being called out and people being absolutely floored by how people knew about these secret sins. I've seen this kind of thing. It's amazing. It should happen all the time. That's what prophecy is really all about. A real prophet is about calling people to repentance, period. Full stop. That's what a real prophet's all about. Calling people to repentance. Second Kings chapter six, again, verse 12. One of his servants said, no, my Lord, but the, uh, the king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's it right there. That's what we're talking about. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may send men and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent horses and chariots and a substantial army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servants said to him, This is hopeless, my master. What are we to do? And he said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, let's stop here for a second now. This is amazing as well. This is amazing. These horses and chariots of fire, isn't this just like, just exactly what happened to Elijah, Eliyah, Eliyahu? Isn't that exactly what happened to him? He was taken up in a chariot, chariots, horses of, horses in a chariot came of fire. Now, I find it amazing because these horses and chariots of fire are spiritual. They were there all along, but they were not seen by anybody except for perhaps Elisha. 
But he saw the chariot of fire that took up Elijah, you know, previous to that. When you think you're all alone, when you think that there's nobody watching, this is part of the great cloud of witnesses. This is part of the great cloud of witnesses. It's amazing. Because when you think you're all alone, God is there populating. <laughs> God is populating uh, your your space, okay, if you want to put it that way, your space with his angels, his beings. So again, like in context here, we have an army that was surrounding them and it looked like it was all hopeless to them, right? Again, going back to verse 15. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was encircling the city. Now, this is the real... Uh, not, the, not, not that the other is not real, but this is like the earthly army of horses and chariots circling the city. And they're all around the city. And his servant said to him, this is hopeless, my master. What are we to do? And he said, do not be afraid for those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. See, so it's like the servant was like, what are you talking about? We're alone here. We're, we're, we're doomed. We're, uh, we're cornered. And then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, I pray, I pray that each one of us are mindful of the great cloud of witnesses that is spoken of in Hebrews chapter 12. You know, it helps us to keep in check, doesn't it? To know that we are being watched, the watchers of the book of Enoch. To know that we are being recorded. To know that there is a whole lot in that other dimension that overlays this dimension that we do not see. There's a whole lot right there. That we, don't, we don't see it with our natural eyes. Verse 18, and when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. Well, that's, that's quite the prayer, isn't it? That's quite the prayer. I mean, today, a lot of Christians would go, Lord, please, you know, show them your love. <laughs> show them your love. Show them your love. That's uh, Elisha. Uh, Lord, please strike these people with blindness. In the footnotes, Literally, nation. Strike this nation with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. It's amazing that these angels, this angel army, strikes people with blindness like this. This is a, pretty much the same kind of thing that happened in the days of Lot. Lot, right, in the city of Sodom, cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, where um, the angel struck those people with blindness as well. And Elymas, the sorcerer in the book of Acts, strick, st st stricken with blindness. Verse 20, when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Powerful, isn't it? Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I, shall I kill them? But he answered, you should not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set bread and water before them. So, they, so that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he provided a large feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. And they went to their master.
And the marauding bands of the Arameans did not come again to the land of Israel. Verse 24, Now it came about after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. So there was a severe famine in Samaria, and behold, they kept besieging it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and a fourth of a cob of dove's dung for five shekels of silver. A fourth of a cob. Um, uh, what? A cob in the footnotes equals about two quarts. So that would be like a couple... A couple cups would be. Verse 26. And the king, and as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord the king. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, from where am I to help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is on your mind? And she said, this woman said to me, give your son so that we may eat him today and we and we will eat my son we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and ate him and I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his clothes. Again, that's a that's a sign of great grief and despair. And he was passing by on the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth. This would be like burlap. Very, very coarse material for those of you who don't know what burlap is. Underneath his body. And he said, may God do so to me and more so if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. Now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man from his presence. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent a man to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door shut against him. Is the sound of his master's feet not behind him? While he was still talking with them, behold, a messenger came down to him and said, Behold, this evil is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? 2 Kings chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The royal officer on whose hand the king was leaning responded to the man, man of God, and said, Even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could this thing happen? And then he said, Behold, you are going to see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we still, or why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, then the famine is in the city and we will die there. But if we sit here, we will also die. Now, now then come and let's go over to the camp of the Arameans. If they spare us, we will live. And if they kill us, then we will die. So they got up at twilight to go camp of the Arameans. When they came to the outskirts of the camp of the Arameans, behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Arameans hear a sound of chariots, a sound of horses, that is, the sound of a great army. And they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians against us to attack us. So they got up and fled at twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys. Indeed, the camp itself, just as it was, and they fled for their lives. When these men with leprosy came to the outskirts of the camp, they entered one tent and ate and drank, and carried from there silver, gold, and clothes.
clothes, and they went and hid them. Then they returned and entered another tent and carried valuables from there also and hid them. Then they said to one another, We are not doing the right thing. This day is the day of good news, but we are keeping the, we are keeping silent about it. If we wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, now then, come, let's go and inform the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Arameans, and behold, there was no one there, nor a human voice, only the horses tied and the donkeys tied and the tents just as they were. And the gatekeepers called and announced it inside the king's house. Then the king got up in the, in the night and said to his servants, I will now tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know that we are hungry. So they have left, left the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and get into the city. One of his servants responded and said, Please, have some men take five of the horses and remain which are left in the city. Behold, they will be in any case like, like all the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Behold, they will be like all the multitude of Israel who have already perished. So let us send them and see. Therefore, they took two chariots with horses. And the king sent them after the army of the Aramaeans, saying, Go and see. They went after them to the Jordan, and behold, all the way was full of clothes and equipment, which the Aramaeans had thrown away when they fled in a hurry. Then the messengers returned and informed the king. So the people went out and plundered the camp of the Aramaeans. Then a a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, in accordance with the word of the Lord. Now the king appointed the royal officer on whose hand he leaned to be in charge of the gate, but the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died. Just as the man of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley are for a shekel, and a measure of fine flour for a shekel will be sold about this time tomorrow at the gate of Samaria. At that time, the royal officer had responded to the man of God and said, even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could such a thing as this happen? And he had said, behold, you are going to see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And this is what happened to him, for the people trampled on him at the gate, and he died. Second Kings chapter 8. Now Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go with your household, and live wherever you can. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it will indeed come on the land for seven years. So the woman arose and acted in accordance with the word of the man of God. She went with her husband and resided in the land of the Philistines for seven years. You know what's amazing? I'm just got to pause here for a second. That God uses like the Philistines for refuge for for his people, like in this sense. And you know, it, it, we read about the... The things happened to the children of Israel in Egypt. But you know, God used Egypt as a refuge, like as a refuge as well, right? For the famine in the days of, of Joseph. And so God used Egypt according to in the you know in the gospels uh, for for Jesus to to flee there to 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 for safety from from Herod. It's just amazing how God works, you know, with, with, uh, God uses whomever he wants to use. So the woman arose, this is verse two, and acted in accordance with the word of the, of the man of God. And she 
went with her household and resided in the land of the Philistines for seven years. Then at the end of the seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Philistines and she went to appeal to the king for her house and for her field. Now the king was speaking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, please report to me all the great things that Elisha has done. And as he was reporting to the king how he had restored to life the one who was dead, behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and for her field. And Gehazi said, My lord the king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. When the king asked the woman, she told everything to him. So the king appointed an officer for her, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the produce of the field from the day that she left the, the land, even until now. Then Elisha came to Damascus. Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, was sick, and it was told of him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazal, Hazael, Take a gift in your hand and go and meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a gift in his hand. Even every kind of good thing of Damascus, 40 camels, camels loads. And he came and stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? And Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, you, you will certainly recover. But the Lord has shown me that you will, you will certainly die. Excuse me. But the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. And he, st he stared steadily at him until Hazael was embarrassed. And then the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why, are, why is my Lord weeping? And he answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. You will set their fortified cities on fire. You will kill their young men with, their, with the sword. The little ones you will smash to pieces and you will rip their pregnant women. Then Hazael said, "What? but what is your servant, a lowly dog, that, that he could do this thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. So he left Elisha and came to his master, uh, uh, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, He told me that you will certainly recover. But on the following day, he took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it over his face so that he died. And Haziel became king in his place. Now in the fifth year of Yor Yoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, when Jehoshaphat the king of, uh, was, me, when Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah, Yoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, king. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned for eight years in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for Ahab's daughter was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. However, the Lord did not want to destroy Judah for the sake of David, his servant, since he had promised him to give him a lamp through his sons always. In his days, Edom broke away from the rule of Judah and appointed a king over themselves. Then Yoram crossed over Zaire and all his chariots with him. And he got up at night and struck the Edomites who had surrounded him and the captains of the chariots, but his army fled to their tents. So Edom was broken away from Judah to this day. Then Libna broke away at the same time. Now the rest of the acts of Yoram and everything that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Yoram lay down with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his son Ahaziah became king in his place. 
In the twelfth year of Yoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, Judah, became, began to reign. Excuse me. And Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king. And he reigned for one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Om Omri, king of Israel. He walked in the way of the house of Ahab and did evil in the sight of the Lord, like the house of Ahab, because he was a son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Then he went with Yoram, the son of Ahab, to against Hazael, king of Aram at Ramoth Gilead, and the Arameans wounded Yoram. So king Yoram returned to have himself healed in Yezreel of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Aram. Then Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Yoram, the son of Ahab, in Yezreel because he was sick. Second Kings chapter 9. Now Elisha the prophet summoned one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get ready and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, then look there for Yehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and have him get up from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, this is what the Lord says. I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not wait. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, behold, the commanders of the army were sitting. And he said, I have a word for you, commander. And Yehu said, for which one of us? For he said, for you, commander. And he said, for you, commander. Then he got up and went into the house, and the prophet's servant poured the oil on his head and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel, and you shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, Isabel, Jezebel. For the, for the entire house of Ahab shall perish, and I will eliminate from Ahab every male person, both slave and free, in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahiah. The dogs will eat Jezebel in the territory of Yezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Now Yehu went out to the servants of his master, and one of them, and one said to him, Is everything well? Why did this crazy fellow come to you? And he said to them, You know very, very well the man and his talk. And they said, It is a lie. Tell us now. And he said, Such and such, he said to me, saying, this is what the Lord says. I have anointed you king over Israel. Then they hurried, and each man took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Yahu is king. So Yehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Yoram. Now Yoram, with all Israel, was defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazael, king of Aram. But King Yoram had returned to Yezreel to have himself healed of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him when he fought Hazael, king of Aram. So Yehu said to the other men, If this is your intent, then let no one escape from the city to go tell it in Yezreel. So who rode in a chariot and went to Yezreel, since Jordan, or excuse me, since Yoram 
was lying there recovering. And Ahaziah, the king of Judah, had come down to him. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Yezreel, and he saw the company of Yehu as he came, and he said, I see a company. And Yoram said, take a, ho take a horseman and send him to meet them and have him ask, is this your intent? Is your intention peace? So a horseman went to meet him and said, this is what the king says. Is your intention peace? But Yehu said, how is peace any business of yours? Turn and follow me. And the watchman reported the messenger came to them, but he did not return. Then he sent a second horseman. And he came to them and said, This is what the king of Israel says. Is your intention peace? And Yehu answered, How is peace any business of yours? Turn and follow me. And the watchman reported. He came up to them and he did not return. And the driving is like the driving of Yehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Then Yoram said, Get ready. And they made his chariot ready. And Yoram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out in his chariot. And they went out to meet Yehu and found him on the property of Naboth, the Yezreel, Yezreelite. When Yoram saw Yehu, he said, Is your intention peace, Yehu? And he answered, What, what, is, what peace? So long as your mother Ye Jezebel's acts of prostitute's craft are so many. So Yoram turned back and fled, and he, and he said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, Ahaziah. Then Yehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Yoram between his arms. And the arrow went through his heart and, sank into, and he sank in his chariot. And Yehu said to Bidkar, his officer, Pick him up and throw him on the property of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I were riding together after his father Ahab, that the Lord brought this pronoun pronouncement against him. I have certainly seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord. And I will repay you on this property, declares the Lord. Now then, pick him up and throw him on the property in accordance with the word of the Lord. Then Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this. Excuse me. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he, he fled by the way of the garden house. But Yehu pursued him and said, shoot him too in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur which is at Ibleam. But he fled to Megiddo and died there. Then his servants carried him a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his grave with his fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Yoram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah, became king over Judah. When Yehu became, or excuse me, when Yehu came to Yezreel, Jezebel heard about it, and she put makeup on her eyes and adorned her head and looked down through the window. As Yehu entered the gate, she said, Is your intention peace, Zimri, his master's murderer? Then he raised his face toward the window and said, Who is with me? Who? And two or three officials looked down at him. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. When he came in, ate and drank, and he said, see now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found nothing except her, the skull, the feet and palms of her hands. Therefore, they returned and informed him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, On the property of Yezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel.
and the corpse of Jezebel will be like dung in the face of the field in the property of Jezreel. So they cannot say this is Jezebel. First Kings chapter 10. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Yahu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the officials of Jezreel, the elders, and to the guardians of the children of Ahab, saying, And now, when this letter comes to you, since your master, your master's sons are with you, as well as the chariots and horses and a fortified city and weapons, select the best most capable of your master's sons and seat him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. But they feared greatly and said, Behold, the two kings did not stand firm before him. How then can we stand? And the one who was in charge of the household and the one who was in charge of the city and the elders and the guardians of the children sent word to Yehu, saying, We are your servants and everything that you tell us we will do. We will not appoint any man king. Do what is good in your sight. Then he wrote them a letter a second time, saying, If you are on my side and will listen to my voice, take heed, excuse me, take the, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel about this time tomorrow. Now the king's sons, 70 men, were with the great people of the city who were, who were raising them. When the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, 70 men, and put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Yezreel. When the, me excuse me, when the messenger came and informed him, saying, they have brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, put them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until morning. Now in the morning he went out and stood and said to all the people, You are innocent. Behold, I conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab, shall fall to the earth. For the Lord has done what he spoke through his servant Elijah. So... Yea, who killed all who remained in the house of Ahab in Yezreel, and all his great men, his acquaintances, and his priests, until he left him without a survivor. Then he then he sent out, excuse me, then he set out and went to Samaria. On the way, while he was at Beit Aked of the shepherds, Yehu encountered the relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah. And said, Who are you? And they answered, We are the relatives of Ahaziah, and we have come down to greet the sons of the kings, or the sons of the king, and the sons of the queen mother. Then he said, Take them alive. So they took them alive and slaughtered them at the pit of Beit Aked, forty men, and he left none of them. Now, when he had gone from there, he encountered Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart right, just as my heart is with your heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. Yehu said, If it is, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand, and he pulled him up to him into the chariot. Then he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And he had him ride in his chariot, and he came to Samaria. Or excuse me. When he came to Samaria, he killed all who remained to Ahab in Samaria until he had eliminated them in accordance with the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. Then Yehu gathered all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Yehu serve him much. Now summon to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshipers and all his priests. Let no one go missing because I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. 
but Yehu did it in deception in order to eliminate the worshipers of Baal. And Yehu said, proclaim a holy assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. Then Yehu sent word throughout Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came so that there was not a person left who did not come. And when they entered the house of Baal, the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. And he said to the one who was in charge of the wardrobe, bring out garments for all the worshipers of Baal. So he brought out the garments for them. Then Yehu entered the house of Baal with Yehonadab, the son of Rahab, and he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search carefully and see to it that there is here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but only the worshippers of Baal. Then they, en they entered to offer sacrifices and burn offerings. Now Yehu had stationed for himself 80 men outside, and he had said, The one who allows any of the men whom I bring into your hands to escape, shall give up his life in exchange. Then it came about, as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, that Yehu, Yehu said to the guard of the royal officers, go, go in, kill them, let none come out. So they killed them with the edge of the sword. And the guard and the royal officers threw them out and went to the sanctuary of the house of Baal and went to the, excuse me, they, they brought out the, the memorial stones of the house of Baal and burned them. They also tore down the memorial stone of Baal and tore down the house of Baal and made it a latrine as it is to this day. So Yehu eradicated Baal from Israel. However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, into which he misled Israel, from these Yehu did not desist, including the golden calves that were at Bethel and at Dan. Yet the Lord said to Yehu, because you have done well in performing what is right in my eyes and have done to, and have done to the house of Ahab in accordance with everything that was in my heart, your sons to the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Yehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not desist from the sins of Jeroboam, into which he misled Israel. In those days, the Lord began to cut off pieces from Israel, and Haziel defeated them throughout the territory of Israel. From the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the Manassites, from Aror, which is by the valley of Arnon, that is Gilead and Bashan. Now, as for the rest of the acts of Yehu and everything that he did in all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Yehu lay, lay down with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. And his son, Jehoahaz, became king in his place. So the time which who reigned over Israel and Samaria was 28 years. Second Kings chapter 11. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and eliminated eliminated all the royal children. The footnotes, all the royal seed. Again, we got seed there, not seeds, meaning children. But Yehoshaba, uh, the daughter of King Yoram, sister of Ahaziah, took Yoash, the son of Ahaziah, and abducted him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and put him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid him from Ath Athaliah, and he was not put to death. So he was kept hidden with, with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. Now in the seventh year, Jehoiada sent orders and brought the captains of hundreds of the Karaites and of the guards 
and brought them to himself at the house of the Lord. Then he made a covenant with them and put them under oath at the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you you shall do. A third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house, a third also shall be at the gate sure, and a third at the gate behind the guards shall keep watch over the house for defense. And two parts of you, all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of the Lord for the king. Then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes with within the ranks shall be put to death. And you are to be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. So the captains of hundreds acted in accordance with everything that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were uh, who were to come in on the Sabbath, walk along, or excuse me, along with those who were to go out on the Sabbath, and they came to Jehoiada the priest. Then the priest gave the captains of hundreds the spears, the shields that the king or that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. The guards stood, each with his weapons in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house around the king. Then he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him, and he get, and gave him testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. When Athaliah heard the noise of the guards and of the people, she came to the, to the people at the house of the Lord. And she looked, and behold, the king was standing by the pillar, according to the custom, with the captains and the trumpeters beside the king. And all the people of the land were joyful and were blowing trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, Conspiracy! Conspiracy! And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army and said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her, put her to death with the sword. For the, for the priest said, She is not to be put to death at the house of the Lord. So they seized her, and when they brought her to the hor- to the horse's entrance of the king's house, she was put to death there. Then Jehoiada, Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people that they would be the Lord's people. And between the king and the people. And all the people of the land came to the house of Baal and tore it down. They thoroughly smashed the altars and his images in pieces, and they killed Matan, the priests of Baal, before the altars. Then the priest appointed sentries over the house of the Lord. And he took the captains of hundreds and the Karaites and the guards and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guards to the king's house, and he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was peaceful, for they had put Athaliah to death with the sword at the king's house. Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. That's a little young, don't you think? That's a little young. That concludes the reading of our Scripture reading for tonight. Let's see what we have here in the chat. As far as questions are concerned, remember, put at Christopher if you want to make sure that you draw my attention to a question. To Yah be the glory, it says, which version are you reading? Just curious, following along with my old KJV. Now I'm reading the NASB. I do switch back and forth between several versions, but I am reading the NASB. Uh, I was tonight anyway. 
Thank you for asking to Yah be the glory. The great deception, I would say don't worship pagan gods. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what would what would you do differently? Elisha was hearing from Yahweh. Um, all I have is Torah. It states don't do that. Yeah, yeah, very clear. Don't worship pagan gods. Um, I think in that context, he himself was not worshiping pagan gods. I think it was in the context of, you know, um, I think he was asking Elisha just basically, you know, um, you know, pray for me that the Lord doesn't hold anything against me. I'm just helping my, you know, my master. So it was more like a service to his master. Um, yeah. So I don't think, I don't think that he was actually worshiping pagan gods. Billy says, I would like to experience God in church, not just hear about him. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. Um, there has been uh, at this point in time. I don't know where I wouldn't. I, I just can't point you anywhere. But there has been throughout, you know, time and time throughout history, there has been little rays of light, if you want to put it that way, of um, movements of God in different churches, different places. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't last very long. I believe it's because of the fact that um, it just becomes corrupt very fast. You know, uh, they, they tend to buy into a, you know, the counterfeit grace, grace gospel. And so, unfortunately, that's that's uh, that's what happens. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Now, if you have any other questions that you want to bring to my attention, if I have not, if I didn't get to them, please. Um, Please forgive me. Put at Christopher in uh, in the in the live chat. That will help me to focus on specific on specific uh, comments or questions. Yeah, there's there's so much going on there in the live chat. You guys are quite active there. Uh, I so I can't get to. Actually, most of them I cannot get to. Um, so if you have asked a question and I have not answered, uh, my apologies. It's just that I cannot see it. Please, if you don't mind, resubmit that in the live chat. Just put at Christopher on that so that it could come to my attention. Huh. This is a good question. Um, Kingdom Concepts. C can you explain why Hebrews chapter 10 changes Psalms 40? A body you prepared me. This is a very good question. And I tell you right up front, I'm, I, I, I can't give you a definite answer. I can just tell you what... I mean, there's only a couple choices, right? So for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, and this is something that actually I have brought this, I put this up on the live chat, or I should say, I've, I've done this in the live stream several times, but I'll do it again tonight. Um, 
let me just see here. I have to set this up. It's for people to, let me see here. I have to set this up so that everybody knows what I'm talking about. If you haven't heard me talk about this before, but yes, I, I've not, I don't think I've really answered that question uh, before. So I'll, I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> how am I going to do this? Okay. Um, I, I, what I'll do, I will compare. Hmm. I will compare King James. It's just I'll, I'll just use the King James for comparison because it's just because at this time. Hebrews chapter ten. I mean, you can use everybody who's listening to this. Uh, you can you can you know open your your favorite Bible translation. Doesn't matter. It's pretty much the same. But um, we have. We have problem. We have a problem here. Okay, you'll see what I mean. And Kingdom Concepts knows what that problem is. Um, and there is, there are theories, and I'll present those theories. Okay, so um, here you are on the right hand side. We have Hebrews chapter ten. On the right hand, on the left hand side, we have uh, Psalm forty. Now, let me just put this Psalm forty in the King James, just to make it apples compared to apples here. Psalm forty. Okay, so um, Hebrews chapter ten. Let's start there. Hebrews chapter ten says, "Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith." This is a quote, by the way. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, thou hast, thou hast had no pleasure. Then I then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Okay. So you notice on the left-hand side, we have the actual scripture that's quoted. It's supposed to be the actual scripture that's quoted. Uh, so the writer, the author of the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 5, is quoting Psalm 40, verse 6. So, watch this. Hebrews says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now, this body uh, is alluding to the body of Yeshua when he was crucified. Basically, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. In other words, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, want you know, animal sacrifice, but you want a body, a more like a human sacrifice. Basically, that's that's the context. Uh, th that's the way this is presented in Hebrews chapter ten. Now, the the original scripture says, "Sacrifice and offering thou dost not desire. My ears hast thou opened." S and then it goes on to say, "You know, burnt offering and sin offering thou is not required, as it says here. Burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin thou is no pleasure." Uh, so you see the major uh, discrepancy here is mine ears hast thou opened versus but a body hast thou prepared me. Now, if you go to the Septuagint, now let me just go over here. I'll open up the Septuagint version. If you go to Septuagint, you'll see that. Um, oh, hold on a second. I got to change this to Septuagint. Okay, um, in the Septuagint, it's actually it's Psalm 40, but it's actually Psalm 39 in the Septuagint. Verse 9, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. That's it right there. That's it. So the author of the book of Hebrews was not quoting from your typical King James Bible. The, the author of the book of Hebrews was not quoting from the Man, the Hebrew manuscripts that is now what we know out, know of as the Masoretic text, okay, which King James is based on. 
New King James. And most English translations are based upon the Masoretic text, unless you have a Septuagint or Orthodox Study Bible. Orthodox Study Bible is based upon the Septuagint. You're going to have my ears, you, uh, my ears hast thou opened versus, but a body hast thou prepared me. So the question is, can you explain why Hebrews chapter 10 changes Psalms 40? So, okay, so this is, a, this is highly debatable. Uh, this is, this is, this is a problem because we have the Jews blaming the Christians and we have the Christians blaming the Jews. Let me explain. So the Jews say that the Christians have changed Psalms 40 in their Septuagint. And they claim that the Septuagint, the, that portion of the Septuagint was actually changed after the fact, like in, you know, after the days of, of like AD, right? After the days of, of Yeshua. So that, that's their claim. That's their theory. Whereas the Christians, they say, oh no, um, that's not true. And this is the proof of it, that the Septuagint is older than the, than the New Testament, which it is, it's supposed to be anyway, much older. Well, I mean, a hundred plus years older anyway, okay? Give or take, okay? Started, it started, uh, the, the translation of the Septuagint started uh, in the third century BC. And it took a while for the entire Tanakh to be, to be translated. So the, the common Christian point of view is, Hey, um, that was, that that's what it says in the Septuagint. And the author of the book of Hebrews was quoting from the Septuagint that existed at that time. But Somewhere down the line, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees didn't like that very much. And so they changed it because they didn't like, they either didn't think it was um what'd you call it? They didn't think it was um consistent with the rest of scripture. Um, they, you know, they didn't like the way Christians were using that to prove that Yeshua was the Messiah. They didn't like the, uh, the way that Christians were using that to say that, that Yeshua was the sacrifice, uh, as opposed to the, uh, you know, animal sacrifices. So the theory is that somewhere is down the line, because you see the Masoretic text was finalized around around a thousand AD and nine hundred AD thousand depends who you talk to. I know that Brother O'Neill will ha, will give you an earlier date, perhaps, but um, it's typically believed that this the Masoretic text, which says, "Mine ears hast thou opened," that text was officiated, if you want to put it that way several hundred years into the so-called Christian era. So there was several hundred years of opportunity for the scribes and the Pharisees to do what they do and change things to exclude what the Christians were trying to teach. I hope that's clear. <laughs> I hope that's clear. Um, Those are the theories. The Jews say that the Christians actually actually changed the Septuagint. The Christians say that the Jews actually changed the Masoretic text. So you need to ask the question, why would the Christians, why would Christians change the Septuagint? Why would they change, mine ears hast thou opened to, but a body hast thou prepared me? Does that really jive? Is that plausible? Or is the other side of the story more plausible? That is that the scribes and the Pharisees 
Hmm, they didn't like that very much. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, and that Christians somewhere down the line, you know, 280, 380, whatever the case was, was harping on that. It says in the, you know, it says in the Tanakh, you know, Psalm 40, verse 6, or whatever it is, Psalm 39, verse 6, whichever version you want to go with. You know, but a body has thou prepared me. Maybe it was just, maybe it was just harped on so much that the scribes and Pharisees said, well, we'll, we'll just fix that one. Which is more plausible? Which scenario is more plausible? That's, that's what we have. That's what we have. It's either one or the other. There's no other, I can't think of any other option. So I Yeah. What can I say? I can't really say much of anything else other than that's what we have. Those are the theories. We that's the evidence we have. I mean, you be the judge, you be the judge. Very good question, brother Pete. Very good question. Will Sr. says, I couldn't do a Sunday church. and couldn't stomach all the Romanized doctrine. Tammy says, as always, a great night. Thank you. Be blessed. Thank you very much, Tammy. Be blessed, you and yours. M many blessings multiplied to you. Thank you. Great Deception says, thank you. I didn't get that. Now I see the difference. Okay. Thank you, Great Deception. Yeah. Um, you'll notice if you if you do a if you do a study. It takes a lot of time to do it, though. But you'll notice if you study, if you if you compare the Mesoretic, the Septuagint, and the New Testament, you'll see that more often than not, the the New Testament is more aligned to the Septuagint as opposed to the Mesoretic. Now, it's not completely aligned to the Septuagint either. There are places where it does align more with the Mesoretic. So whatever the New Testament authors had as a text, it was some hybrid, some hybrid between what we have now today is, is the, uh, the Septuagint and the Masoretic. But again, as far as I see, uh, as far as I have seen, it does align more with the Septuagint. Not 100%, but more with the Septuagint. Let's just say this about Yeah, Kingdom Concepts, this is this is right as well. This is another one of these things. You know, does say Pierce not lion. You see, this is a thing too. You look it up in the Masoretic in Psalms 22:16. Actually, while we're here, let me see. Psalms 22. But you see, this psalm is not even quoted in the New Testament. From my, if my memory serves me correctly, this psalm is not quoted at all. Surprisingly enough. Yeah, so... Um, In this instance, the King James actually changes what the Mesoretic says and in 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 puts. Uh, oh, let me just say here.
Yeah. Um, so let me just share the screen here. This might be difficult to see, so my apologies. On the right-hand side, there we have a comparison of the different translations of uh, Psalm 22, verse 16. Um, most of them say they pierce my hands and my feet, even the King James. Um, however, like, there's a footnote here. Um, uh, it's hard to even see that footnote. Let me just pull it across here. Some Hebrew manuscripts, Septuagint, Syriac, Vulgate, Masoretic text reads like a lion. Uh, but, you know, we don't have that in the Septuagint over there. On the, on the left-hand side, we have the Septuagint. Uh, Brenton translation, uh, for many dogs have com com compassed me, compassed me. The, uh, the assembly of the wicked doers has beset me round. They pierce my hands and my feet. So I'm not sure where they get that Septuagint here from. But it says here, uh, following some Hebrew manuscripts, I guess some Septuagint manuscripts, Syriac, Vulgate, Mesoretic text reads like a lion. Oh, maybe it's saying, well, maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding this. Maybe it's saying that they, they, they translated it as pierced my hands and my feet following some of the Hebrew manuscripts, following the Septuagint, the Syriac, the Vulgate. But the Masoretic text reads like a lion. Yeah, so that's it. The, the Masoretic text reads like a lion there. And that's another thing. It's like, so did the Pharisee, did the scribes and the Pharisees change this to say like a lion instead of pierce my hands and my feet? Because again, they didn't like the clear... <laughs> If I may say, if I may say so, my you know, if I have to say so myself, uh, they didn't like the clear um, depiction of crucifixion here, so they changed it to like a lion. Uh, again, I know Jews would certainly disagree with that. That they would say like a lion is the original text, and this is changed to to suit the Christian uh, doctrine. Pierce my hands in their in my feet. That's what they would say. Another reading is like a lion. Yeah. So if you, let's say if we go over to Safaria again, I'm pretty sure that that would say like a lion over there. Pretty sure about that. Being a Jewish Tanakh website, uh, pretty sure they're based upon the um, Masoretic uh, Psalms 20 verse 16. Oops, I went into 21. Where is it? Where is verse 16 here? Um, maybe it's in Psalm 21. No, what's going on here? Um... Oh, sorry, 22. 22, that's what it might be. Here it is. Here it is. Like lions. This is actually verse 17. Dogs surround me, a pack of evil ones closes in on me. Like lions, they maul my hands and feet. Okay, so again, that's different. So they got a, uh, with Rashi, Isaiah 38, 13, uh, they have that there. So, yeah, very interesting. That's what they do. They change that. Okay, so that'll be it for tonight. Tomorrow night we'll be back, same time, same place, wrapping it up. As always, thanks again, guys. Thanks for your fellowship. Thanks for your questions and your comments. A lot of things covered tonight. A lot of good stuff we covered. So as always, it has been a blessing for me. Uh, you guys are awesome. Thanks, guys, for all that you uh, for all that you do over there. You're in the you're in the comments, you're fellowshipping. I appreciate appreciate you guys. You guys are awesome. You guys are world changers, as I always say. 
All right, guys, that's it. We'll be wrapping it up tomorrow. We'll be back same time, same place, 7 p.m. Eastern, picking up where we left off. Um, we'll see what happens on Friday. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, Brother Will um, coming back. It still has to be confirmed whether he will or not. He said that he'll let me know. So we'll see whether he comes, whether he's uh, able to to come back on Friday. Um, and uh, on the weekend as well, we have our Shabbat meeting on Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern, as always, and uh, Sunday as well. Uh, we'll start again 7 p.m. Now, there is a slight chance. There is a slight chance on Sunday we might uh, go live at 1 p.m. also. If we have a guest that's not available and it just doesn't fit well any, you know, any other time during the weekend, we will go live 1 p.m., on Sunday, if we confirm a guest, so so keep that in mind. Um, again, make sure you're subscribed if you're not subscribed and you have the notifications on. So until then, we'll see you. One John says thank you and blessings. Thank you, One John. Appreciate you. Vinny says thank you. Christopher, many blessings to you and all. Shalom. Many blessings multiplied to you as well, Vinny. Thank you. Okay. See you guys tomorrow. As always, Diabi the Glory says, great night. Hope all goes well with y'all and shalom. You too as well. Blessings multiplied to you guys. And Wheel of Truth says, shalom. Awesome. Awesome. Shalom. 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 Great. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen. Amen. See you tomorrow night.